Great. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, let's let's start with this uh, really interesting webinar of today. Uh, we have a perfect, great audience as well. So I just want to let give you a few uh, a few instructions for for the session uh, go perfect. Um, please use the forum of each presentation uh, so we can post their uh, our congratulations to the presenters, inspiring thoughts, anything you want to, to share with us there, uh, I, I will be checking on and I can read it if you would like for, for the presenter as well. Uh, I am posting the link for the presentation on the chat here on the, on the Zoom system. You can see it and you can click on it and directly go into the, to the forum. Well, you, you can just scroll down, right, to find it. Um, please, everybody, uh, keep your, your mics in silence during the presentation. Uh, maybe uh, after each presentation, we're going to have a direct interaction between each other. And so we can open our mics. Let's see if there are not uh, uh, so much question to handle. Uh, so that matters. And uh, please, uh, you can write your questions or comments also uh, on, the on the chat in the Zoom system. So I can read and figure out how we can manage the, the, the ending session of questions and answers, okay? So uh, we were going to have four presentations and the, uh, there, there will be uh, uh, also presented by their own authors and will be in the same order uh, that is showing the website, right? If anyone have uh, a question before, before we start with the presentation, you can do it right now, please. Great, so let's begin. Our first presentation uh, is going to be by Pim Belinga. Uh, so nice to meet you, Pim. Uh, he is co-founder of Graspo. Uh, it's a open education resources website for mathematics and statistics. And he's going to talk about a collaboration between TU Delft and U20, uh, how they embrace open educational resources. So please, Pim, uh, it's your turn. Thank you so much, uh, Rosie. Um, and uh, thank you for this introduction and for the rest of the uh, participants and uh, attendees. Um, for me, uh, good afternoon. I, uh, I'm speaking here from Amsterdam, uh, but maybe a, a good morning or a good evening uh, to you, uh, to all of the, the places in the world where you are. I've already seen a lot of countries come by. So it's really exciting. And, uh, and I'm thankful that all of you are here and that we can together talk about open education. Um, so as, as Rosie mentioned, my talk will be about mainstream adoption and in particular two universities um, that have uh, together uh, embraced uh, open educational resources in their, um, uh, in their education. And this is TU Delft and University of Twente. And I will talk about their experiences. Um, what I will first do is, is sort of go into briefly, how did we get here? Um, um, and then what we've done there, what we've learned and what we're working on right now. Um, and it is a story of, uh, I think, a, uh, a successful adoption of, uh, of open educational resources. Of course, there are way more stories um, uh, about successful adoption and I'm positive about all of them. And this is just one of the examples um, um, at two universities in Europe. But first, how did we get there? Um, so this is me a few years ago. Um, I started out as a statistics teacher at uh, Erasmus University, a different university in the Netherlands. And I, um, I uh, taught a introductory statistics class and I, I really liked it, especially also the interactive parts. Um, uh, but I also found it quite difficult because it was really clear that some students really needed more uh, practice than others. Um, and uh, like many other teachers, I found a solution in online practice so that people could practice at their own uh, time and pace um, and, and sort of went into blended learning where you have the offline uh, lessons and the online practice combined. Um, but then I did run into a challenge, which I think a lot of teachers have run into, which is where do I get the learning resources from then? 
And of course, this will not be new for most of you. Um, the challenge that I had there uh, was uh, I could either go to copyright publishers and get a full package, uh, nicely packaged, but often at quite a cost for my students, or I would have to do it all myself. And um, basically, I like neither options, and especially the second part, um, it, felt, uh, it felt weird because there were so many uh, wonderful things happening at other departments, but often I, I could not find it or I could not access those resources. And what I really wanted is um, to actually make sure that we could uh, uh, build on top of each other's work. Um, and of course, this is the whole idea uh, behind open educational resources. Uh, but I also wanted to do it in a way where I could actually uh, do that quite easily and that the, the user experience uh, was also uh, uh, pleasurable and easy to use. Uh, and then I thought, okay, if we know so well what we want to do, uh, then maybe we should try that out ourselves. Uh, and so that really became uh, my mission to, to make sure that we could actually collaborate in an open environment together. And um, uh, since then have uh, founded uh, with my co-founder Graspel, uh, which is a, uh, a merger between the words uh, grapple to struggle and grasp to understand. Uh, and um, uh, what I will now do is go actually into, from the perspective of Graspel, uh, what we have done uh, at uh, the two universities, TU Delft and Twente. So first some context about the TU Delft. The TU Delft is um, uh, a very uh, large technical university in the Netherlands. It has about 24,000 students uh, and they really are a believer in open education. They were one of the first um, to use open courseware uh, uh, after MIT um, and, and it's really in their vision. And a few years ago, um, they, they had a challenge which was uh, to organize a campus-wide math uh, for around 15,000 of their bachelor students uh, because they wanted to make sure that students could practice online and get immediate feedback. So this was a similar challenge that I faced myself as an instructor. Um, and um, they did have a, a project, uh, the Project Innovation in Math, which is what PRIME stands for. And they had a number of instructors now making sure that they could actually do this as a campus-wide um, uh, movement. Uh, and of course, they also face this same challenge. Like, would they, would they work with copyright publishers? Would they do it all themselves? Open collaboration. Um, and um, their motivation really was to make sure that they could push for open. Um, they really wanted to make sure that they could customize the materials. And they definitely wanted to prevent a vendor lock-in. Um, and um, what they had managed to do was say, okay, we can work with a very large group of instructors on this. So there were like 30 instructors uh, um, uh, and students assistants and project managers. So they were willing to do quite uh, a number of things themselves, but they really wanted to make sure that it was easy to use and reliable. Um, and uh, so they finally uh, decided that they would actually use a, an internal team. You could always call, almost call them a content team um, that will make sure that they would actually create all those materials. Um, and then they would function as sort of a, a almost an in-house publisher. So finally, they settled on, um, on a combination, I would say, of these two models, where they would do quite a things themselves, but it would also be an open collaboration. Um, and then just to briefly show you how that looks now, um, is students can practice online uh, in their learning management system at the TU Delft. Um, get instant and immediate feedback and, and really learn from, from, the, from the mistakes and the, the, the attempts that they make. Um, uh, now, they use a grasp for this. I, I, I think this is just some, some uh, um, uh, absolute self-promotion here, but I think it is also useful for the context. So they, they use it, uh, a grasp to, to collaborate on all these learning materials. Then the teachers uh, can create a course students can practice actively there, and then the teachers can see um, uh, the insights uh, on where students are struggling the most so they can focus their attention there. Um, and what I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about is that uh, the TU Delft um, uh, has also made a lot of contributions already to the open community. So all of the, uh, for example, linear algebra exercises that they pulled together from all of these different instructors they made them online and now they published it um, uh, uh, yeah, on their open Creative Commons license out there for everyone uh, to use. Uh, and for that, um, uh, we've also received a prize from, from OE Global uh, for that collection 
Um, so I'm really excited that it's it's actually being created and published open and everyone can access that um, uh, with an internet connection without even the need to log in. Now, there are still more coming, so they're, they're now working on a lot of calculus exercises that will be shared soon and also video lessons and, and inter interactive lessons. So there's a lot um, that is happening at the TU Delft. And um, in a few minutes, I will go, I think, a little bit into what I think has made, uh, has made that uh, adoption work there. Um, but for now, I first also want to show the experience of the other university, uh, also a technical university in the Netherlands, University of Twente. Um, it's uh, uh, a little smaller, but still um, uh, uh, quite uh, a, a big university and especially um, uh, also a very good university. Uh, and the challenge that they were facing um, was to create a standardized quality uh, over all their math courses, also campus-wide uh, for all the engineering students. Um, but they were coming from a commercial publisher uh, uh, background uh, and they really ran into the challenge there that they could not customize the material that they use and they really wanted to do now. So they really wanted control, uh, but also innovate their teaching. And they said, okay, we really want this open collaboration model um, uh, because we, we do not have the, the time and luxury to do it ourselves, uh, but we do um, uh, uh, want to have this control. So for them, I think open education was not sort of the prime motivation um, it was just a means to an end. They wanted to, to innovate, to make sure that they could combine assessment with, uh, with practice and to sort of blend the distinction between that. And if open educational resources um, uh, uh, help in that, that um, uh, suffice or sort of that worked for them. Um, uh, but it was not a goal for them. And I, I, the, I think the reason that I'm stressing this is because I think uh, open educational resources are really now making this step from uh, from only the people that really want it to um, uh, to the people who who also see uh, the benefits uh, of it and and are using it mainly for that because it just provides them value. Um, but what we also notice is, I mean, these are two technical universities in the Netherlands. Um, it, it can often uh, be more more similar, and yet. Every curriculum is always slightly different, we found out. Um, so the TU Delft has their curriculum with their sort of building blocks of, of exercises. Um, and then what we did at the University of Twente is actually uh, create a sort of a, a puzzle of what exactly would they need, um, uh, which was similar, but slightly different. And then Graspel basically functioned as a sort of a matchmaker, uh, making sure that we could see all of the open educational resources that were out there and especially also at the TU Delft and make sure that they are presented to the, to the University of Twente in, in a right fashion so they could easily adopt it um, because they did not have time and there was very high pressure uh, to make sure that it actually would start in the new year. And then also what we did at Graspel was uh, basically function as a sort of an open educational resource publisher uh, and create some of the extra modules that would be needed to make sure that there was one package uh, that had no gaps so that it could actually be adopted uh, into the uh, their uh, entire uh, math education. Um, so actually at that time Graspel functioned as an sort of external OER publisher. And what we see now happening at Twente is that this is actually moving inside. So now that now they actually have a team um, that, that does more of this work. Um, and that actually enables them to not only reuse the materials, but also to revise it, to remix it, um, and to redistribute it because they've now also added things and improved things that are now shared back to uh, the TU Delft. So now we have actually collaboration across different organizations. Um, and uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm really happy about that because that's really uh, the thing where we, there were always beautiful things happening at these universities, just like many other universities around the world. Uh, but now they're actually combining all of their uh, contributions and actually sharing that uh, with, um, with the rest of the world. Uh, so that every time we have this, this ever growing collection of open educational resources that um, can be accessed and reused and, and revised uh, by everyone. So these were the experiences at the TU Delft and U Twente, uh, but what did we learn from that? And what can maybe others learn who also wanna make sure that 
uh, open educational resources are used in mainstream education. And what we uh, found out that seems to work well is first of all, to make sure that um, the resources that are created are as modular as possible because modularity makes sure that things can be reorganized and reshuffled um, and can be fit into a context that is similar but slightly different. Um, and I think there it also really helps to have at least temporary uh, organizations that can do sort of this mixing and matching and make sure that um, the adoption for other organizations is as easy as possible uh, and that that, uh, that there are also uh, people who can make sure that the gaps are filled um, so that there uh, is no distinction in that sense between uh, commercial publishers and open educational resources because both of them um, uh, uh, can can uh, fill the entire curriculum um, and then uh, open educational resources have added benefits such as uh, preventing vendor lock-in and make sure that things can actually be customized. Um, uh, and, and that I think really helps to make sure that mainstream big organizations can actually adopt open educational resources into their mainstream education. And the final thing is that these, what we see have emerging is these internal content teams because the instructors are often very busy. Uh, and then the internal teams uh, can actually make sure that they uh, keep track of materials. Because if we're honest, um, um, uh, there are challenges also with open educational resources. Because first of all, um, uh, checking quality has now been spread out uh, uh, over multi multiple departments, but often multiple organizations as well. Um, so keeping track of who actually checked what exercise uh, and can ensure that quality becomes, uh, becomes more challenging. And especially if instructors have limited time, um, then uh, sort of filtering through that material um, uh, yeah, becomes, becomes more difficult. So you have to find other ways of making sure that uh, there is actually matching material um, that is of high quality. And the final part is, I think, uh, because um, uh, the success of easily editing all these materials, uh, because that is happening, all these instructors are uh, uh, changing and improving exercises, uh, but that also leads to a large amount of new items um, uh, that all have to be uh, uh, tracked and and uh, um, uh, uh, yeah kept in uh, in an overview um, and with multiple people working on the same resources that definitely becomes a challenge. Um, and so what we've seen is that or what we think would really help um, is in terms of building capacity uh, uh, for. Um, the uh, successful implementation, successful long-term implementation of open educational resources is uh, two things. It's one on the people side, um, these sort of in-house content managers that maintain overview, that process feedback, uh, that can coordinate between all the instructors um, is definitely something that we've seen that really uh, uh, enables um, uh, adoption in universities. And the second thing I think is on the infrastructure side. Uh, where we need systems to keep track of all these um, uh, versions and of all these resources uh, and systems that can help facilitate collaboration uh, between people in organizations, but also between organizations. Um, and um, to get to the final point and actually try to make that concrete, we've, we've started a, a list, um, which is not complete, uh, but of all the uh, key requirements that we now see that uh, any open educational resource software um, uh, should enable. Uh, and this is, uh, that does not have to be RESPL. There are other platforms out there as well. Um, and I think this is useful for every, uh, uh, for all these different uh, applications uh, and to really make sure that they uh, enable all these requirements at least. And, and there's probably more. And I think this is also something that at least we're very interested in uh, to see uh, if other people recognize these challenges, but also if they if they see other requirements or other solutions uh, that could uh, could help address those challenges. And one of the things that we're now working on is actually keeping track of all these different versions. So now that we have people editing all these uh, uh, different items, um, uh, it, it's, it becomes quickly uh, very hard to track. And that is something that we're now working on to make sure that actually um, all these different versions created by different people uh, can actually be tracked easily uh, so that you actually have an overview of all the things that are created um, and so that they can be shared easily with others. 
So um, uh, this has been uh, hopefully a, a, an overview of the things that we've seen in the past years at uh, two of the biggest technical universities in the Netherlands, um, uh, describing how we get there and really this, this mission on, on making sure that we can collaborate and can build upon each other's work. Um, that we now actually see that happening at the TU Delft and at University of Tente, where they have thousands of students in their actually in their actual educational programs um, that are doing this right now, that are collaborating, that are sharing resources, reusing it, revising it, redistributing it, um, and that we've seen that making sure that the resources are modular, that if you mix and match it and fill the gaps, and that you have teams internally that can actually help instructors there. Um, uh, that really facilitates uh, uh, successful adoption and that what we should do in terms of capacity is making sure that there are the right people in place and that also means new functions that may not have existed in the past uh, and it also makes sure that we uh, have the right software or systems in place um, and we've uh, shown at least some requirements uh, that we think are, are key uh, in, in uh, providing that systems. Um, and I really hope that we can uh, continue to talk about this. And I'm very interested to see if there are questions or, or remarks on this. And otherwise, also after the session, I'm always very open um, to keep discussing this because I think this is something that um, is useful for the entire open educational resources ecosystem. Um, and uh, at Graspo, we're very uh, enthusiastic and ambitious about making sure that we can make education more open and more personal for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pim. Uh, we already have two questions from the audience, so I will read them for you. The first one comes from Tim, and he's asking you, uh, can these exercises be exported outside of the grasp to other platforms? Yeah, uh, great question. And um, I think the brief answer is yes. Um, then the longer answer is um, there's more to say about it. Um, uh, one, that is definitely something that we facilitate. Um, can it already be done easily? Um, well, we're now working on, on making sure that it can be done like in the program more easily um, so that you can export it into an open format. And this is uh, something that we are, have been working on for quite some time. And also in the last OE Global Conference, we have actually um, uh, facilitated a uh, a discussion on that, also on creating an open format so that the exercises can be exported. Um, and of course, the goal is not exporting per se. Uh, I think the goal is to make sure that it can be interoperable into different platforms so that you can also import them. Um, and and our, uh, our vision and uh, a philosophy there is, is making sure that we have a, a very well-documented open format um, uh, created in such a way that it can be easily import it into most other platforms as well, uh, because that is definitely some the, the thing that we're um, uh, passionate about and that we're striving towards is to make sure that um, you wouldn't need Graspol, uh, uh well, in the future, if, if you think there are other platforms that will work better for you, because that's, of course, is the whole uh, idea uh, and ambition behind open resources is that there is no vendor lock-in, that they can be used openly from all places, uh, also in other open platforms. Um, so that is, I think, the longer answer. Thank you, Pim. Uh, Bea also has a question for you. She asked you about uh, the term, when, when you use the term teams, do you mean students, uh, student assistants, or what do you mean by team? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I, I think, again, this could, could be talked for, for longer. I think um, the short answer is, uh, in this case, the internal content teams that I mentioned include, indeed, student assistants, um, uh, but they often also uh, uh, consist of a, I would say, a sort of a project manager uh, a type um, and also some instructors that are more involved uh, in, in uh, creating um, uh, resources, but also keeping track of it and, and reviewing and curating them. So it's, it's, a, it's a broader combination, uh, but also including uh, students' assistance uh, with the goal to alleviate um, the instructors that are, that are teaching and instructing, um, because they're often uh, swamped by, by their educational work. So uh, brief, yes, uh, they, the teams include student assistance. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Robert also asked you about GitHub. Uh, he said that it was mentioned as a possible tool to keep track of the versions. And I think I saw in your website that you are using GitHub as well. I'm not sure. But well, he's asking if you have considered this tool to manage the, the, the thing with the version of the of these resources. Yeah, great question. Um, um, so GitHub is a, a version control system for code. Um, and um, what we do think is, is uh, uh, open resources need similar systems. Um, so we have indeed considered um, uh, using GitHub and, and um, uh, maybe still Git can be used um, as, a, as a sort of more uh, bottom infrastructure. Uh, but um, uh, because GitHub is really created for maintaining code, um, uh, we think that, uh, and that's also something that we see, is it also comes with extra challenges. Uh, and sometimes the things that you want to do with resources, with learning resources, is different from, uh, from doing that with code. Um, uh, so one uh, example uh, is that um, the resources are much more modular. Um, so while you can have a big code base where that you can uh, can control, um, now you have all different kinds of modules that are also used across organizations. So what we um, we have considered using it, uh, we think there are absolutely a lot of things that can be reused and should be reused uh, uh, from Git and GitHub. Um, but that uh, uh, open educational resources, because of the context, um, are slightly different from code. They also require a slightly different system. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I think for now I'll keep it at that. But I'm, this isn't a subject I'm, I'm very uh, sort of a topic I'm very uh, interesting and uh, interested and, and enthusiastic about it. So so definitely something that I I think deserves um, um, more attention, uh, but maybe in a different setting. Great, great. So um, there are two comments from Gino and Miriam. Uh, they congratulate you for the presentation. Um, Thank you. Also, Robert, I give you thanks. And he wants to uh, take a coffee <laughs> to talk further. I'm also interested in, in how you handle this uh, track of the versions issue. And I think it would be all from, from the audience for for you, a great work, Pim. Thank you very much for this. And I only uh, want to ask you if you could post in the form of your presentation the links to those resources that you have mentioned right now. Uh, for instance, this this open tool for uh, keep the, uh, for tracking the the version of the resources, etc. Maybe that can uh, increase the participation in, in the forum. Yes, absolutely. I will do that. And um, yeah, thank you all for your attention. Um, and also, I want to uh, sort of, again, give uh, sort of a shout out, I think, especially also to all the instructors and the student assistants at uh, TU Delft and University of Tensa, because it's, it's of course, really their, their story. And it's, it's, it's they who are doing the, the, the wonderful work and uh, being open to sharing that uh, with each other. So uh, um, thank you all. And also, thanks for them. Thank you, Ping. In on the chat, there are uh, uh, some comments for you, just uh, for congratulate your presentation. Yeah, th thank you, and I will definitely share all the resources in the uh, in the section. Thank, thank you, Rosie. You. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, our second presentation uh, will be by Robert Schuwer and Ben Jansen. Uh, the um, okay, Robert Schuwer, he's professor of Open Educational Research Resources at Fonts University of Applied Science. He owns a master in mathematics and a master in science and computer science and a PhD at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, ben Jansen, he's a consultant and researcher. He owns a master of science as well. And they together are going to present uh, a work about the process model of using digital learning materials in teaching and learning activities. So thank you, Robert. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, struggling. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you, and uh, uh, welcome all uh, participants to this uh, presentation. Um, actually, uh, this will be the content of my presentation. First, I will sketch some context. Uh, the context uh, in which this process model 
uh, initiated was in the acceleration plan. People who uh, followed uh, my talk this morning, uh, well, they know now, they, they hear now uh, some of the uh, same stories. Uh, the acceleration plan is in the four years innovation uh, program, which is uh, currently in its third year in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands Dutch higher education, uh, and in um, well in in several topics, uh, which in its uh, jargon it's called zones. Zones uh, institutions of higher education are working to boost innovation uh, into uh, on this topic, and one of the topics is a zone uh, about digital educational open resources and open between brackets because it is digital educational resources uh, as, as a whole and open educational resources are part of it, if, uh, but we are not only working on OER. Uh, when we started this, uh, uh, this work uh, in the, uh, this, this collaboration of several institutions, uh, we needed a, a conceptual model to think about the topic at hand and to, uh, to, to think about what can we do in these four years to boost innovation. And therefore we devised this uh, conceptual model where in the, part, in the top of it, you see that there, uh, we, 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 uh, we think about learning materials uh, starting from a vision on education and we use the constructive alignment theory as a model to, uh, to uh, devise um, uh, uh, good education and in constructive alignment, the learning outcomes you need, the assessment and the teaching and learning activities you design uh, should be aligned with each other. And learning materials uh, play a role in both the teaching and learning activities and also in the assessment, they can play a role. And these learning materials can be on a continuum from uh, open to, well, in this, uh, uh, when we devised this a uh, couple of years ago, we say close. I think the better term is commercial uh, learning materials. Uh, but, there, but there are also, um, as, as, as we also talked this morning, also uh, um, materials which we call semi-open. These are open learning materials, but only open for a specific group of people. Uh, to uh, work with these learning materials, you need an infrastructure, and this infrastructure is not only a technical infrastructure, but also comprises an organizational infrastructure, so, for instance, the support needed to, uh, to work with these learning materials, and also an accommodating policy. And teachers and students, but uh, 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 they, uh, they use some principles when they are trying to create their, what we have called their optimal mix of learning materials. And this optimal mix of learning materials can comprise of all these different types of learning resources that can be um, analog. So it can be uh, plain books, it can be digital, uh, it can be open, it can be semi-open, uh, it can be commercial, uh, and, uh, and, and for the teacher uh, and for the student, they all have their specific optimal mix of learning materials to achieve their goals. Um, we don't talk about analog uh, learning materials because this, uh, this uh, whole program is about uh, boosting uh, innovation uh, in education with ICT. Uh, but we should uh, keep in mind that this, uh, this books, so analog books can also be part of this optimal mix. Um, well, and uh, when we thought deeper about this conceptual model and thought about the teaching and learning activities, we, we, uh, we, uh, we found out when we were thinking about activities we wanted to, uh, to start in, in our uh, program, that we need some level, uh, a, a level more deep about this teaching and learning activity, because this conceptual model is only about the what, but it says nothing about the how, and we needed more insights about the how. So as uh, uh, our group of, uh, within this, uh, uh, within this um, innovation program, we thought about how can we uh, get, get more uh, uh, model for, uh, how can we devise a model for the how of this teaching and learning activities in combination with the learning materials. And we needed this because we want, uh, uh, Ultimately, in our uh, program, we want to devise better support for the use of OER or educational resources in general. And we also wanted to determine demands for professionalization. So therefore we needed this 
model and uh, this uh, uh, and we see this model as a tool to realize this and we uh, we de uh, we we decide uh, or we distinguish between two scenarios and for reasons which will become clear uh, later on in this presentation we call these scenarios the reading list and the instruction uh, first the reading list and we came up with this model uh, the uh, we we did not do some extensive literature uh, research about uh, about um, models but we uh, we use our collective uh, intelligence our experiences as a group to come up with this model and you see in this model the the read which we called the reading list which actually is the yeah, the more or less classical situation, which I think is still in use in, in, in many of the, uh, of the institutions uh, nowadays. In the, upper, uh, in the upper part of the, uh, of the screen, you see the, the part where the teacher or instructor is, uh, uh, what, what he or she is doing with learning materials. They are uh, creating their optimal mix. It is this uh, dotted line. And for this optimal mix, they are, searching for learning materials. This search can be in the cloud. This search can be in a local storage, mostly, uh, well, it can be departmental storage or maybe a storage which is uh, available throughout the whole institution. In most cases, it will be some network drive, or maybe they have their own private storage, their own hard disk or their own uh, personal website where they have these, uh, 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 where they have elements, where they have uh, their own materials and they create, and maybe they can, should, should also create some materials, some new materials. And this, it all, they, uh, um, they can, uh, they get their optimal mix of learning resources, which they either publish and publish is at least uh, a reading list that can be uh, that can be the list of mandatory and optional literature the student should uh, should uh, should study should use uh, when they are taking their course. Uh, but they can also um, uh, decide for parts not to publish it, but only use it. For instance, uh, they can they can um, uh, create a, a video which they will use in their. Um, in the uh, uh, lecture hall, but will not, but uh, can for reasons uh, not uh, for reasons they they um, probably have uh, decide not to publish it. For instance, on an, uh, on a public platform or on a platform from the from the university they are working at. Uh, but the, the 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 least thing they publish is a reading list, and this reading list is their means of communication with the student and uh, the students actually do more or less the same things they are also creating their optimal mix of learning materials that can be all the mandatory uh, stuff which is on the reading list they but maybe they uh, they create their own uh, materials uh, for instance the notes they make uh, during the uh, uh, during the the, the, the lectures uh, uh, they can uh, search for additional materials when they are not uh, uh, when they want to uh, uh, practice uh, things um, with more. They need more practice than is offered by the uh, learning materials, and they also uh, um, they use this this optimal mix. But they can also uh, um, uh, decide to publish, make it available, for instance, for their fellow students uh, to um, uh, to use. Um, well, I, I uh, haven't said anything about this quality control because this quality control at the student side uh, will be uh, in their use and they, they, they have created their optimal mix of learning materials. In using, they get this feedback loop uh, in which they, uh, they maybe find out, okay, I need more learning materials, which will affect their optimal mix. And they can also have some quality control, some feedback, for instance, in a survey, which is uh, in the, at least in the, in the Netherlands, taken at the end of each course, where students can give their uh, opinion about the quality of the lectures and the quality of the learning materials. And the teacher can use this feedback to, uh, uh, to improve uh, its optimal mix of learning materials for the next run of the course. But this uh, teacher can also 
use uh, uh, quality control with the same feedback loop. Uh, they use the learning materials and maybe uh, get some feedback from the students uh, or they, they, they find out, well, well they, they don't have some pre-knowledge available and then they, uh, he or she can search for additional materials and uh, add that to this optimal mix. This will be the process model in the, uh, in the scenario which we have called reading list. Then we uh, uh, said, well, there is a second, uh, second part, we, and we called it the uh, instruction, uh, in, in which you see the, 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 uh, more or less there are the same processes, but there are some differences. These are the, uh, the situation in which the student gets more agency, uh, more active learning. Uh, it is not that the, 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 the teacher decides everything and the student has to follow. For instance, practices uh, which we call open pedagogy, uh, and which fall on this uh, umbrella of open pedagogy are examples of this scenario. What the uh, teacher at least publishes is a kind of instruction. That can be a challenge, that can be a, a, a kind of a problem which the uh, student, and mostly they will work in groups, then uh, will try to solve it. And that is their uh, learning process, uh, which they will follow. And for this uh, process, they will also search for uh, additional resources. Maybe the teacher uh, gives some, uh, some, some, um, some clues for, 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 uh, for, for resources, uh, which the student can use, but, uh, but in most cases, the students will, uh, uh, will search for their own resources. And you see here that, that in ultimately it could be, and it could be part of the learning process and the learning uh, process which is designed that the teacher uh, together with the teacher, together with the students, are creating resources which the student, uh, which the teacher then maybe can use uh, in next runs of the course, or maybe can supply it to the to the uh, next group of students who will do the same challenge. And you see also that because of this, uh, there's much more interaction possible in this scenario between teacher and students. There can also be uh, maybe a one-on-one -on -one or a, a directly uh, in a communication bet uh, bet uh, between the teacher and the students about the quality of the resources which are used or which are created. So we call this instruction and this is a completely uh, where you see that that that, that uh, in, in in maybe in ultimate cases the the difference between the teacher and the student that uh, can be uh, are are much uh, less than for instance in this uh, in um, reading list scenario well when we uh, have created uh, these two process models, we were able in, in our program to, uh, to, to find out what activities we needed and uh, where to work on. Um, first, the support part. Uh, well, each of these uh, activities, uh, there should be support available, but especially in the second scenario, the support should be available both for students and for teachers. And there's also a professionalization needed. Uh, this is an, a, a professionalization scenario based on, uh, on, on, on a publication from the IOF, uh, where you see that uh, the, uh, uh, they, uh, when it becomes to OER, they, um, they uh, differentiate between these four competencies. You should have awareness of OER, should be able to search, use, and adapt or remix the OER. And these are the activities uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have distinguished in our process models and where the process is are, are set, uh, they need uh, uh, professionalization for, uh, uh, for this competency on this uh, activity. And in this second scenario, this instruction, this instruction should, this professional say should be available, not only for teachers, but also for students. So that is a demand you put on an, uh, on an uh, um, educational institution that when you uh, want to uh, have this more active learning scenarios in your institution, you should also take care of uh, a, a sufficient support and sufficient professionalization activities, not only for your teachers, but also for the students. And that is also the conclusion we want to draw. This process model is a tool to better determine the support and the professionalization needed. And for pedagogy with more student agency, this support and professionalization should also be available 
for students. And that concludes our talk. Great presentation. Thank you very much, Robert and, and Ben. Um, I don't see questions from the audience. Uh, we are now 48 participants. Well done, people. Well, I have, uh, I have a, a more than a question. Is maybe it's a comment? I don't know. Uh, it's about this uh, process of quality control of the resources. You you explain it. You describe it. I think it's very interesting that the student can work with the with the resources as well as the teacher. And I think this can be a way to identify also the preferences uh, of the of the students in terms of uh, resources. Or even though it, 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 they could be uh, ways to figure out how to present better the resources for the for the students. I don't know if you have grasped of this this type of, of things in the in your model. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, as you saw in this uh, in this model, uh, we we did not go very deep into how this quality control was done. Uh, we did some suggestions. Uh, the, 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 the teacher can have uh, in his immediate feedback this control. It can be control about uh, the quality control can also come from from um, student surveys or but also in direct contact between students and teachers. Uh, but uh, there could also be parts of this uh, quality control could be done, especially when these are open educational resources in um, uh, in, in, for instance, the, 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 the student ratings on the materials, uh, where uh, uh, when they are openly available, and that can be uh, uh, can their own students, but can also be uh, other uh, persons from other institutions reusing your materials and providing some uh, quality control, maybe uh, uh, writing a review in it, maybe directly contact you uh, with uh, with their um, with their suggestions for improvements, uh, etc. Actually, the latter is what we in the open movement also uh, uh, well uh, uh, advocate as 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 a, as a uh, as an advantage in using or being involved with OER, but actually in the, um, uh, the it, it is rather rare that you as when you publish OER that you actually get some comments from from users you don't know. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, yeah. I, I support uh, greatly the 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 the, um, the 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 concept of uh, uh, professional communities, communities of practice, where teachers together in their in their own profession um, uh, uh, collaborate on creating and sharing and reusing these resources. Because this community can also be the uh, the, 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 the 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 platform where you can um, get your feedback on the quality of your uh, learning materials, and they can also be. The, the 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 group which in a sustainable way eventually can uh, can keep this uh, keep this uh, OER movement alive for their resources. Great, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, maybe you can post a picture of your model, uh, the conceptual model that you show us at the. I've po I've posted my my slides uh, already ah, on, on uh, in the uh, on the page which is added to this uh, webinar, and I've also uh, posted. Uh, uh, the presentation on the slide share and both uh, links are available in the in, in the platform. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. So no further questions. So let's go with the third presentation. Um, this will be introduced for, for um, Ramesh Chander Sharma um, and also Eva Osianinso. Okay, and let me tell you about a little bit about Ramesh. Uh, well, he's, um, uh, oh, I can find the notes, I'm sorry. Okay, well, he's a PhD in educational technology and he's specialized in web 2.0 technologies. He's working as well in the uh, open educational resources uh, platforms and has uh, great experience uh, 
and in, in publishing works about open educational resources. And also he has a professional experience in aeronautics, which is very interesting for his profile. And Eva Ossianilson, well, she's, she's from Sweden. She's professor of innovation and open online learning. Uh, she's considered uh, an influencer and researcher in the field of open, flexible, online and distance learning. And he's the lead of the ambassador for the open educational resources at the ICTE. So uh, let's begin with their presentation. Please, Ramesh. Thank you, Rosa. Okay. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us in this session. And thank you, Rosa, for the introduction. Uh, I welcome my, I think I can see my three colleagues. Uh, uh, Professor Abba is there, Professor Daniel is there, and uh, uh, Marianne is also there. So they are our co-authors. In fact, this is our study, which is a global study in which uh, uh, around uh, more than 30 colleagues from different parts of the world, uh, we collaborated to examine that how the open education and open science practices as a use case uh, they have worked during this pandemic. And just a brief uh, means uh, the colleagues, they uh, represented on a global scale, like uh, we had from Netherlands, uh, from Turkey, from United Kingdom, uh, from Spain, uh, uh, and Dr. Daniel is from Spain, uh, Sweden, and Dr. Eba is representing me from India. Then we have from United States, South Africa, Australia, Nigeria, Mexico, uh, your home country, Greece, South Korea, uh, France, Canada, another colleague from UNESCO, France, uh, Taiwan, uh, like that. So this way, these are our colleagues who had uh, shared their expert views and use cases from their own countries and can see the a truly a global picture. And I hope that uh, uh, these are well-known experts uh, in their own uh, worth. So, I, I think I don't, I don't need to introduce them one by one. Uh, our study, it provides an overview of the status of open education and open science for our uh, global society. And our focus was in the first year of uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, it represented practices and use cases from around uh, uh, 13 countries and global regions on the challenges of formal education uh, during this uh, uh, outbreak. And a special uh, focus was laid on the potential solutions and examples of open education and open science uh, in these uh, regional use cases. So it helped us in the way that the analysis and comparison presented insights about the developed strategies and implemented uh, practices in different regions worldwide. And their discussion offers opportunities and recommendations on how the open education and open science can innovate and improve formal education in schools, universities, or lifelong uh, 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 learning uh, uh, during the ongoing uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as afterwards. Now, responding to the impact of COVID-19 on formal education, uh, our study profiles global perspectives uh, of uh, OES and open science uh, uh, there through highlighting the practices and use cases uh, from these countries. And by drawing on the examples of extent practices, uh, the insights into effective strategies, they are means they have come up with certain recommendations for how we can use open education and open science uh, for innovation and improving formal education. Now, our response to these challenges is of vital importance to sustaining its ideals and philosophy. So with the emergence of uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, this pandemic, one is tempted to either stay reserved for a variety of reasons or be inspired to embrace the new normal. 
Now, as we all know that uh, this, this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it had shaken all societies and the whole globe. And as a consequence, uh, means very, very recently, even a document of OECD uh, reported that the educational systems in all the countries, they were affected. And uh, we witnessed uh, disruptions and partial uh, lockdowns. In some regions, formal education was interrupted and new approaches and alternative delivery modes, they had to be intervened from day one and uh, so on. So the governments, the public authorities, the educators, the pupils, and their parents, uh, they were not prepared facing these unexpected challenges. So thrown into say like cold water, all parties tried to develop and implement solutions and workarounds. So as the whole world on a global scale, we were witnessing uh, this pandemic that how the our planet is has become vulnerable to global health crisis and outbreaks. So such interconnected challenges, they remind us of the pivotal role of science and technology to respond to these challenges by finding solutions in the service of humanity. Uh, acknowledging the opportunities enabled by rapid development of information and communication technologies in the interconnectedness of the world, scientific information and sharing of knowledge resources, they have proliferated as, as uh, just Robert and before that team uh, uh, indicated in their presentation also. So uh, we found that uh, the global health crisis affecting the whole world means profoundly like uh, this COVID-19, it has compelled or heightened the need for enhanced sharing of the information and knowledge. And in line, with this need, open science comes into prominence or stands out uh, as a scholarly movement in the current digital era to respond to the global issues the world encounters by showing the transformative role of um, uh, uh, science and technology. Our key interest is how the potential solutions and examples of open science and open education, they have been introduced and used in different regions worldwide. Uh, through the analysis and comparison of these regional mm -hmm. use cases, we wanted to explore the developed strategies and implemented practices and how much they were built on open education. So uh, our study, uh, it, it investigated that uh, uh, with a particular focus on the affordances of open education, and uh, learning therefrom. So our intentions were to identify whether the sudden surge in distance education modalities has also increased open approaches. And if these changes might become embedded as operational once the pandemic is over. And by come examining these case studies from different countries as a regional representation for the first year of pandemic, like in the beginning of uh, 2020 until the 11th March of uh, this year, uh, 2021, we deliberated upon the strategies and practices followed by the institutions. Our methodology was uh, uh, like uh, a qualitative comparative case study approach uh, uh, while acknowledging that open had different connotations and interpretations in different regions. So the case studies here describing the impact of uh, this COVID uh, outbreak on formal education and how distance education was adopted. We collected the data from various countries and uh, in what ways the open education has been proposed and addressed uh, uh, using distance and online uh, methodology here. That was the uh, our uh, primary uh, research uh, a question from there. So we based our study uh, and we collected uh, practices and use cases. These were the four guiding uh, questions for us. And there are two general questions and two specific questions on the adoption of open science and open education. Like uh, the general question uh, faced, we asked on uh, different regions that how this formal education it has affected the 
um, by the uh, outbreak and what were the uh, you know adopted uh, strategies from there and the specific question was how much open education and open science have been proposed and addressed and what is the difference between when the original intentions were there or uh, the uh, means what will be the contribution in the future uh, uh, of of uh, uh, these uh, uh, guiding uh, there so this is how we uh, noted that uh, the impact on formal education it was very high among these countries due to the high level to the moderate level and uh, uh, so on so we have uh, you know uh, found that uh, the overall key aspects which emerged from it we divided them into these three broad groups micro level meso level and uh, at macro level macro level means how the formal education uh, they have uh, uh, been offered at a distance for the first time because everybody was just switched to in fact uh, uh, means much of the research has been done and a new term like emergency remote education emergency remote teaching etc was uh, given a, a term for that so some similar approaches and then we found that uh, uh, there was missing infrastructure because all of a sudden the people they need to search for that what can be the tool or the platform so going in for microsoft teams or zoom or google meet or there are many other open source uh, tools like uh, big blue button or jitsi uh, uh, etc uh at meso level there were uh, we noted that the kind of diverse teaching and learning methods and practices they were adopted and the variation in the use of oer and open education etc at the micro level we noted that there is an urgent need for the professional development uh, uh, in the uh, in the countries for the uh, teachers uh, to 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 prepare them for this so this uh, may i request uh, uh, dr daniel and abba uh, also if they would like to add uh, to this uh, presentation their thoughts thank you so much these are the references and i have already uh, put the link to this presentation which is in the slide share in the our uh, oe global platform there okay so thanks a lot Thank you so much, Ramesh. A great presentation. Congratulations for the for the for the effort that you and your team have have made. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's very yeah. important to to have a, an overview of what is going on in terms of uh, distance education, but also in terms of general education, right? Because the pandemic and how this affects the efforts of open education, open uh, educational resources as well. I don't think there are any questions. Well, th there is uh, one question from a person who, whose name I don't identify is, is CDLH. And it says, uh, what were the main geographical differences that you found? Uh, and, and I think this can be answered by one of the slides that you share with us, right? Yes. Yes, um, let me share it again. In the meantime, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Eba, would you like to add something in the meantime? Yes, um, while you are looking for the slide, maybe I can add that um, yeah. maybe there were not so many, um, so, so large geographical differences yeah. as I there were. For this. Is it visible? Yes, it is. Uh, shall you maybe start to talk about this one, Ramesh? Uh, okay, okay. So actually, on on uh, if we see from the uh, geographical region wise, as we uh, uh, divided, say for example, if I talk about the macro level, which is about the missing infrastructure as a challenge to the formal education, we found that uh, uh, the formal education sector was generally not ready. So like in case of Turkey, France, Mexico, and the UK, they reported that uh, providing free access to online resources using television and internet. Uh, in India, in our case, uh, the satellite based uh, Swayam Prabha, uh, it is the name given, which is a 
bouquet of around 34 direct to home uh, channels. Uh, so that was uh, uh, there. And uh, OER usage was reported through projects like in, uh, through a project called as uh, B-E-L-U-G-A, Beluga or Beluja, how do we uh, say it in Africa, then the Diksha platform in India, and say countries like France, Nigeria, South Korea, or Sweden, they reported that these strategies for reaching out to the disadvantaged uh, uh, geographical or valuable, means vulnerable populations there. Uh, similarly, in Netherlands, uh, Sweden, and Taiwan, we found that uh, the uh, development, the work was uh, proceeded towards the development of open policies and strategies. Uh, so like that. And on, in case of, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, there was uh, uh, in uh, developing countries, say like in India, there were many cases because I know that some of my friends, colleagues, they reported to me. And I think it was, it may be a global phenomenon about the uh, loss of jobs because the schools were closed and some of the institutions, they took the uh, plea that uh, uh, no classes, no students, no admissions, so no salaries and something like that. So these were some of the you know, geographical uh, issues uh, which were uh, noted by us. Maybe adding to that is that we, we also found, uh, as many other studies have also found that uh, depending the the current infrastructure and the culture of teaching and learning and education had also a very high impact. So it's not just the, the geographical sites as per se, but it's also the, the, the structure in the country and in the region, which uh, play a huge importance. And of course, um, institutions who were well, not prepared, not well prepared because no one could prepare oneself for the, for the situation, but who already have, you know, infrastructure, technology, um, open pedagogy in place uh, could uh, manage it easier. And those who didn't have that, uh, for them it was really, really hard. Thank you, thank you, Eva. Thank you, thank you, Ramesh and Eva. Uh, Bakari Diayu also posted a question, but he thinks that he's already answered it. And they, if they can go to, oh, sorry. Uh, I have posted the link. Okay, let me paste the link for the presentation in the chat here. In the meantime, Rosa, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Also, I posted the link for the forum of, the, of, the, of this presentation on the chat. So uh, maybe you can go there and, and find some additional resources of this presentation. And I, I want to share with you guys for that uh, th this type of work is not easy to do it because it depends not only of, uh, I mean, to, to say geographical uh, differences uh, can be very tricky, right? For instance, in, in, in my own country, Mexico, um, we have differences uh, geographically uh, located, right? If we have several differences between the north and the south, the west and the western in our own country. So I think it's kind of tricky to try to make difference in, in a larger context. Uh, I think this type of studies can, uh, can manage uh, another type of difference found that maybe regional uh, situation that can be handled, but also uh, the, this type of, of uh, issues that you have identified. Um, I don't know if, if, if we have enough representation in some other countries, uh, which also have, for instance, I, I'm thinking in America, right? Like uh, South America, which uh, Santo Domingo and other uh, countries that are more apart from us, but they also are uh, uh, traveling, uh, having this, this trouble. And thank you, Sharma. He's, he's sharing the, their, their presentation with all of us. So uh, there is for, for everybody. Thank you very much uh, to the whole team for this presentation. I don't think there are any other questions or comments. So let's move to the uh, 
Uh, this is our final presentation. Um, it would be introduced by Tel Amin, I think so. And I'm not sure if there is any other person who's going to be the representative of the team. Um, tell, tell uh, there is Dominic Orr, and I think, are you going to be the presenter as well? Thank you, Dominic. Well, um, we are going to talk about uh, uh, about um, an, an open policy for open educational resources. So I think we can start with your presentation. All right, um, so let me try and share the screen here. We're waiting on a couple more colleagues to show up, but I'll begin. So I trust that you have my screen and I'll open up the camera again. All right, so uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, great to be here. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dominique, and then uh, Moitza and Anna should join us shortly. And we're here to talk about uh, an OER policy uh, strategy that we've developed as part of the Masters in Leadership in Open Education at the University of Malagorica. And uh, we'll begin by talking a bit about what the program itself is. Uh, many of you might already know, some of you might not. And uh, the Open Education Strategies course, which is what uh, where we developed this, this, uh, this model that we're using to develop policy. Uh, we'll follow that with a discussion on the materials that we use and how we, we drafted this. And we'll finalize with, I think, the most interesting part, which is how this was applied into two case studies. So uh, to begin with, I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about uh, the course uh, and the master's program itself. It's, uh, it's called the Master's in Leadership in Open Education. It's hosted in Slovenia at the University of Nova Gorica, and it's a two-year program. I think it's one of the, the few programs that really deals with the issues of open education and de dedicated to the idea of leadership in open education. And the course is, uh, the, the, the program itself is, is a two-year program that focuses on every aspect of, of open education from uh, development of technologies and advanced technologies, design, policy, legal concerns. And the idea is to really promote uh, the sort of professional that can get into the field of open education, have a really uh, systematic view of the field. And so it has a, a fairly large group of, of uh, professors and, and lecturers from all over the world to get a, a, a very big, you know, wide perspective on, on the topic and a very diverse set of students as well. So it's, it's a pretty exciting program. And, and in this, uh, in this uh, Masters, we have one course, which is called the uh, Open Education Strategies, and I, it's been co-taught by uh, Dominic and I. And it is focused on the idea of identifying how to build programs around uh, open education, particularly how do you design a policy from scratch? And you think about this systemically, you know, from, from a gap analysis moving forward. And um, so I'll pass the word on to, uh, to uh, Dominic to talk a bit about the materials that we used and how we sketched this, this uh, proposal together so that students could develop their strategies for open education. Dominic? Yeah, thanks very much, Tel. If you could keep control of the slides and just go on to the next slide, sure. that would be super. Yeah, so um, as Tel said, I also have the pleasure to be um, co-leading this together with, with Tel and um, we're using two basic um, background materials. And the reason is uh, what we're really trying to aim for in the end is to get to the phase where um, it's possible to look at all different sides at times of strategy and policy and open education and have some kind of framework from which to view them critically and to see, okay, what should they be containing? Um, what maybe is the process to make a good policy or a good strategy? and um, just to make sure that it's an inclusive one. In other words, all the different perspectives have been taken. And um, the two major resources we're using, using for that is on the one hand, um, the guidelines um, on the development of open educational uh, resource policies, uh, which Ben and myself developed. Ben Janssen is also here in the call. Um, this is a very nice resource, I think, in the end, uh, to involve many different people working on it together. We also had a lot of kind of peer reviewing that went into this, and it's now available in English, French, and Spanish from the UNESCO website. 
And um, there's various elements in it, but one of those is really exactly as, as you can see here from the chart, just to kind of take the user, take the interested learner, or take the policy maker or somebody evaluating a policy through a whole series of steps. And we've actually uh, used this also uh, within this in the semester with the students to kind of go through, okay, what should we be looking at? What should we be thinking of? What are the typical elements we would be expecting in a policy? And um, we often see that this is really a challenge to apply this to something like open education, because I think all of us in the community, we feel quite happy talking about open education or open educational resources. But when you start to really applying them as a strategy or policy, you have to kind of unpack them and say, okay, what do I really mean? What is really the focus of the policy? Is the policy, for example, focused on open education or is open education a facilitator, or as we said many years ago in the, the OECD report, a catalyst for other things we're actually trying to achieve? If it's for other things, we should make sure the other things are very are given high enough prominence in the, in the policy. So we are using, on the one hand, this document, which kind of walks through and actually it's designed in the way that after each chapter, uh, key questions are asked, because the idea is by the end, you should actually get to a policy which you can implement and then review afterwards during uh, the monitoring improvement phase. And the other, doc the other tool we're using, which is a nice interactive tool, is um, uh, the policy game, which um, was developed uh, by our colleagues in uh, Brazil. And here we have for the policy game, uh, when we were actually using it last in the last semester together with, together with Moria and uh, Anya, we didn't have it yet as an online tool, but we now do. Um, so uh, here's a, a quick screenshot from it, but basically it's possible then to work across work remotely, work across boundaries um, using this particular tool. And, and this tool is there to really just look at um, various elements and to check well, how open is something or how it closed is something. And it's a great way to kind of use it to really review a policy or strategy once you've already got kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts or the, 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 the puzzle pieces already kind of set, so a way to review them. So, but as Tell said, the more interesting point is, okay, so we, we set up this kind of framework, but how can it be applied then? And um, so the, we would just like to use two short presentations of uh, policy and practice. And um, I see now uh, Moya is there, so I would uh, pass straight on to her. I think uh, Moya, it looks like you had a bit of a rush to get here, but... Um, uh, it looks also like I can pass over straight to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic. Rush, indeed. Yeah, can you see and hear me well? Please just thumbs up. Yeah, perfect. So many thanks, and I hope Anna is in charge of, of scrolling down the slides. So re yeah, I'm really happy to be here, um, to be part of this short OER policy webinar, much the same as I was happy to be a student in the course on open education strategies taught by both uh, Professor Tell Amiel and Professor Dominic Orr, who both gave this uh, inspiring introduction. So my case study project is a real project indeed, uh, a project I'm working on at my day job, uh, where I lead the communication, dissemination and exploitation package for a European Horizon 2020 research project called Newcomers. Uh, so Newcomers, uh, it's an acronym actually for New Clean Energy Communities in Europe. And in this project, we explore this new clean energy communities in Europe, their ways of operating, their, uh, the business models that they apply, that they develop, that they improve, and the potential that uh, the energy communities have uh, to support the energy transition in Europe, uh, both the opportunities and the barriers that they encounter uh, in realizing their potential. 
So my role in this project is to promote, um, to, to promote the research findings and to disseminate uh, the project's research, research findings, not only inside the, let's say, narrow research community, but also externally um, in relation to the interested stakeholders like the other energy communities themselves. Uh, you know, it's, we have 10 case studies uh, inside the project, but there are, of course, many other energy communities uh, all around Europe. Then it's the policymakers, it's the subject matter experts from different fields connected to energy, climate, environmental, social, economic issues. Then it's the media and citizens in general. So the question that I ask myself as a student of the master's program leadership in open education is how can open education support that kind of endeavor? And why should it support actually? What's the aim uh, and where and how can open education add value to this kind of, uh, let's say, basic research project to its findings? And how can it create um, some larger or broader societal impacts? And how to approach this, all these different dimensions of open uh, in a project that's uh, already running and has a preset of, let's say, predefined uh, research and dissemination activities. So how to plan the open education elements, what activities or tools to choose. And the course on open education strategies as part of the master's program leadership in open education, as it was already mentioned, came just right, you know, to, to, to um, uh, offer some answers to these questions. So um, from the, in my assignment actually, uh, which you can find in the open repositories in Nodo, uh, the link you will find at the end of this presentation, um, I have actually closely followed the seven step process that Dominic already mentioned in the beginning from the, from the guidelines on developing OER policies. So it all started, of course, as you can see at the right uh, upper side of my slide, it all started with the understanding the potential of OER, and then it continued with the second step, which is about determining the OER vision. And I'd like to stop here for a second. I will not go into any major details, but just to tell you how I have framed uh, this vision, the OER policy for the newcomers project and for one of its key um, educational and dissemination outputs, with, which is the Our Energy Online uh, Educational Platform. So how I formed this vision before I continued with step three, which is about framing the OER policy itself. So in uh, framing the newcomers projects OER vision, I focus on the following three points of action, which you can see on this slide, and they are related actually very closely to the general educational goals as they are defined in the SDG 4, SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goal number four on quality education. So first of all, it's about improving the relevance of learning content to individual energy communities needs because the needs of the energy communities around Europe might differ significantly. Uh, one community might need some really basic information, for example, about the energy sources they have available in their country. And another community perhaps might need some really sophisticated uh, additional information about the possible business models they can operate within. So they really need this learning content that they can reuse, remix, um, uh, redistribute for their own specific energy community related needs and expectations. Then the second, um, the second um, point of action in a way is about providing multilingual and localized content, which would enable high quality learning content to be available in local national languages because it is no of no use to an Italian energy community, for example, to have some learning content available in English or it's of little use, so to speak. So it needs to be, um, the, the learning content needs to be available to be adapted, you know, to uh, uh, change the language, to localize information regarding energy sources available, uh, the types of energy use, etc. And last but not least, the third circle is about the energy community skills development. We are all aware that uh, we need to develop the skills of the energy communities in order, in order for them to respond to the changing world uh, and the future of learning, uh, which has to do with digital learning, online learning and open educational resources. 
So all these three educational challenges are really significant uh, for the energy communities. Um, and the research findings of the newcomers project actually confirmed uh, this significance. You know, the energy communities actually expressed their need for this kind of educational resources where they could share their findings, their practice examples, their skills, and learn from other energy communities. Um, and therefore, a clear way uh, needs to be defined to contribute to facing them on the European level by making better, more efficient, more open use of the research and science, exploring energy issues in general and energy communities in particular. And as you can see on this slide, um, therefore, I thought when you know creating this final assignment for the course as part of the um, uh, leadership uh, in open education master's program, I thought that this kind of proposal to make the newcomers project an open educational project, uh, an OER in itself, so to speak, will likely be welcome not only by the energy experts and researchers and the energy communities, uh, but also by the policymakers on the European level, as there are really clearly defined, uh, let's say, strategic aims of the open science policy defined by the European Commission. And this is just an excerpt from, from the European Commission side, where they say that open science is actually a policy priority for the European Commission. And uh, the standard method of working under its research and innovation funding program, because it improves the quality, efficiency and responsiveness of research. And on the next slide, I go, I, I zoom a bit on the, on the um, uh, let's say specifics of the open science policy under the Horizon Europe, uh, the new funding program, where uh, it is clearly explained that it's, imp uh, it's really important for the open science to go as widely as possible to incorporate citizen science, which means translating the findings of science for the citizens and also for engaging the citizens to be part of the scientific endeavors uh, in a way to co-create science uh, and uh, to be engaged and involved uh, in these processes and to promote the responsible research and innovation um, of the European Union and, and the energy sector, of course, is it's, it's one of the key sectors in this. So that was uh, the reason actually why the Newcomers Consortium, uh, the partners of the Newcomers Horizon 2020 Consortium decided to really add to the existing um, uh, communication, dissemination and exploitation uh, activities, also a package of activities related to open education in supporting the open science. So as you can see on the next slide, another guideline uh, that came out of the seven step uh, process of the guidelines that Dominic uh, was mentioning earlier, uh, is the importance of framing um, the projects OER vision as part of a, let's say, larger or broader open educational related vision or strategy, if one already exists. And in my case, in our case, in the newcomers case, case it does because the European Commission has set this really ambitious strategic goals on making European science open science. So um, how can open education support this? What you can see on this slide is part of the um, uh, part of the, let's say, a concept that we have acquired. Uh, it's coming, it's, it's from another course on the leadership on open education. It's not directly from the open ed education strategies, but it's from a workshop uh, for open education practitioners that was held by Professor Christian Aranzi and uh, Dr. Javier Atenas. And there I found this really interesting um, graphic, you know, which shows the intersection or the overlap of open science with open education. And um, in this way, we uh, were enabled, you know, as, as a consortium and me actually leading this process to clarify, to clarify how OER, an OER policy could support the open science approach of the newcomers project. So now coming from, from the strategic view to really a more concrete, uh, let's say planning and implementational phase, which is the step five in the, in the seven step pro process that Dominic was presenting. Um, let me just give you this snapshot of how we approach defining the key building blocks of the newcomers projects OER policy and how we drafted the implementation plan. It's really just a, just a snapshot 
uh, but of course you can read the details in my final assignment, which is um, openly published on the Zenodo open repository, of course. Uh, but here is how it looks like uh, in only one picture. So the background of it is this overlap of open science and open education. And this is taken from a trend report on open and online learning uh, that you can see the link on the right side of the slide. And this background actually uh, shows how connecting various forms of openness, you have the open science, which consists of open access, open data and open research, and how this overlaps with open education in general, with, which consists of OER at the heart of it, but there is also a larger circle of open course, open teaching, etc. So uh, it really shows how we have uh, applied this to the newcomers project uh, and how connecting these various forms of openness can actually add value to a European research project actually. So for example, the overlap between open science and open education, especially from the OER, open educational resources and open course perspective, for example, that's of major interest to the newcomers project. And you can see here, I just use the logos to make it as clear as possible, uh, what kind of concrete tools or software we will use uh, to make this research project uh, as open as possible. For example, we will make use of the open repository, Zenodo. We will uh, post on the free encyclopedia, Wikipedia. And we will also create, beside creating a handbook that will be a designed and printed version, we will create one on the press books, for example, as an open collaborative uh, tool uh, in order to engage all, you know, very diverse set of interested energy communities and other stakeholders, as well as we will create an open course on the Canvas uh, learning management system, the free for teachers version. So, um, more than going into details of what we will do, because we will do that in the next six months, because there is the project end in May next year, and we surely hope to exploit the project also after it ends. Uh, more than going into details, I'd really like to emphasize here how both the guidelines that Dominic mentioned and the policy game uh, that Tal presented can actually lead you um, from very strategic umbrella overall visionary frameworks towards making really concrete decisions about how to implement the OER policy, what tools, what open activities, open educational activities to choose uh, for your own project. And this, is, this goes for my project and I'm sure it also goes for many other participants' projects. And that's the beauty of it all, as I see it. Uh, the course itself, the open education strategies, and the whole uh, master's program, Leadership in Open Education, taught at the University of Nova Gorica in Slovenia, um, really uh, leads you to acquire all these different skills in strategic um, slash policy, as well as implementational instructional design, as well as uh, technological, you know, digital technologies aspects of uh, open, edu uh, open education. So I guess these are all the ingredients that the future leaders in open education actually need. So happy to take any comments or questions uh, in the discussion part, but before that, uh, over to Anna for her case study. Okay, thank you. I hope I'm audible. Um, as my predecessor just uh, explained a lot about the mechanisms and uh, you've heard the Moitzas uh, part of the um, uh, Moitzas case, I will, I will present my case now. I will try to be really um, fast and um, I will uh, stay up to the point just um, talking about uh, so how, how the guidelines and the policy game um, what were the outcomes for my uh, my case? So just briefly about me, I'm Anna Fabian. I work at the Joseph Stefan Institute. Uh, I'm a student of the leadership of open education, um, of uh, yeah, open education, and also an affiliate of the Open Education for a Better World program. Uh, involved in uh, creating the visual identity of the program, taking care of the dissemination activities, and also help with the organization of the program's events. So a little bit about the context. The International Online Mentoring Program was launched in 2017 by the University of Nova Gorica in collaboration with the UNESCO Chair on Open Technologies for OER and Open Learning at the Joseph Stefan Institute. 
as a response to Commonwealth of Learning study, which concluded that the development of OER is very uneven across regions and largely individual with little attention paid to practical implementation. So the program objective is to connect developers of open educational materials with experts in the field of open education, volunteering as mentors. The program is open to all from all regions and continents, regardless of their professional background, education, citizenship, or any other limiting factors. So the global success of the program has shown that there is enough motivation and need for progress in the field of open education. From 18 to 21st of October, uh, the program will host its fourth edition of the yearly Eduscope uh, event, where 72 developers and 60 mentors from all over the world will showcase their OER achievements and present the insights valuable for future activities of the program. So, to the point, identifying a need for policy. Maybe to the next slide, please. Um, so the open education practices and OERs developed and tested in the program have proved to be useful for building capacities in open education. However, to develop a sustainable model for use, reuse and sharing of OER through collaboration and strategic partnership, the, um, the program needed to address its key challenges. The analysis was done following the seven-phase policy process described in the guidelines, an activity called the Open Education Policy Game. Uh, the game was used as a diagnosis tool, especially to assess the extent of change to be made for achieving the best possible outcome, which was determined in the gap analysis phase. So, the results showed that the program, with its growing number of participants and materials produced, would benefit greatly from a clear set of guidelines for open licensing, development of OER, quality and curation of the materials, as well as establishing a collaborative open online environment that would facilitate the discovery, use and reuse of the OER material. So, to get a comprehensive overview, maybe to the next slide, um, uh, of, the program, uh, of the program's objectives and ambitions, a master plan took place, a shape where an operational foundation was determined. Objectives were twofold. Uh, on a primary level, they were aimed at supporting developers and mentors of the program, addressing the issues of open licensing, capacity building, awareness raise, raising, adopting mechanisms for quality assurance uh, and sustainability via appropriate ICT solutions. Secondary level, envisioned planning for partner engagement strategy. Wider consultation and increasing stakeholder engagement was planned via the advisory board, which actively participates in the consultation process with the program coordinators. Together, they act as a government, governing body, and their mission is to provide early insights into areas where the objectives are too ambitious or need more support and ensure that stakeholders are properly empowered and informed about the overall master plan. Their involvement also ensures that the plan is prepared and executed collectively. Coordinating body is charged with leading the teams in collaboration, and those are the hub coordinators and individuals charged with policy implementations are then the mentors. So the, uh, the next slide and my final one. Um, the challenge was, is to bring together key stakeholders of the program for the implementation of the policy for which an appropriate communication strategy was developed. Already in place was the program's website and an annual event where the community gathers to share and discuss the progress of OER. The program progress calls um, to participation and other activities are communicated via the social media channels. In addition, in 2021, several webinars have been organized throughout the year with the vision to harness online mentoring, relationships, and promoting active participation in the development of OER. Furthermore, the Open Education for Better World platform uh, was developed by me team in close collaboration with the organizing team. The platform enables developers to show their OERs, actively participate in the events, and connect with the community. In the future development, uh, further material encompassing clear set of guidelines, uh, helping potential developers is planned and works on building participatory community via platforms communication services, where stakeholders could also meet, discuss, and seek solutions that would increase access, equity, quality, cost inclusion and innovation of the open education. 
So I hope I managed to keep you interested and I thank you all for your um, attention. And I think now we open the floor for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, the three of you. Thank you guys. This is a really interesting uh, project we, we have uh, for different outputs, right? Uh, great, great presentation. Thank you. I don't think there are uh, questions in the chat. So there are some links that were posted by, by several of you uh, for, for the audience. So if you can copy or, or maybe later I can post it in the, in the forum of the presentation. And there are several comments uh, uh, for congratulate the presenters. Thank you. I, I do have uh, something to, to tell about, about this topic. I, I, I wonder about uh, open education, what does it really mean for each of us? Uh, because I think there is a, a, a difference between open educational resources and open education as it is. So uh, in, in my country, there are several differences in how we interpret this, this, uh, this topic, right? And, and I would like to know, how did you understand the topic? How, how did you uh, implement open education in, in this project? Um, uh, further, not, not, not only talking about open educational resources, but education it, itself. Yeah, maybe I could uh, make a start to respond to that. It's, Thank you, Rosie. It's, it's like a, of course, that's a huge question. Um, and I think this is the point that it's very easy. Often it's very easy for us to answer these questions when we're talking in a small context. Um, so when we're talking to other people we work with or in a particular context, we have very fixed ideas. It's very interesting when you then start to try and develop a strategy or a policy, um, especially with the goal of you know, trying to mainstream or something, then often we have to then review these things. So we did set, um, I think we're always setting a couple of kind of limitations when we say, okay, what do we mean by open education? And I think generally what we're doing is we are actually kind of start, and what, or one thing I often do is to start from saying open education is um, the, um, the process you want to um, unfold around open educational resources. In other words, it starts for, from open licensing. It starts from all these opportunities to actually collaboratively work on materials and to kind of collaboratively work on a, a learning space. Um, of course, the, and the thing I always think is when we talk about open education or open pedagogy, this is not new to education. This is something we've been talking about for at least 150 years. Um, but I think, and that's why I always think it's interesting to then connect it to how we're going to do it today. And how we're going to do it today is then the strategic question. Um, and, and that's why I think it's always very interesting to say, okay, let's, let's really be very practical. Let's say, okay, let's take a project, let's take an initiative, let's try and develop a strategy around it. And then, and then we really have to kind of get a bit more fixed about some of the concepts we want and also perhaps the compromises we're going to take. So one element of the uh, procedure or these, these different steps uh, which are mentioned here is to be hugely inclusive. And even when you get to the launch of the program or the launch of the strategy to always understand any strategy is a living strategy. So it itself, so the concept in it should always be reviewed and called into question. And I think that is part of the philosophy we always are, are, are very much supporting when we talk about open education as well. Thank you, Dominic. And, and I think this question can be answered for any other of the participate, participating of, the, of this webinar and, and please. Yes, I'm, I'm really happy to contribute here because uh, as I mentioned already in my presentation, we really, I know our starting point is this is a Horizon 2020 European Commission funded research project. We really started from this premise of the strategic aims of the European Commission, which is about open science, you know, 
share the research findings as early and as widely as possible towards uh, the, the project becoming a citizen science project from the in, in both directions so that uh, it's the, the research findings are translated for the citizens and also that citizens can collaborate in, 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 in making this science. So what we really thought about in the consortium is um, how to you know, add this a meaningful package of open educational activities that would support this strategic aim of the European Commission on, on the open science and citizen science. And it's really about, you know, Dominic mentioned this inclusiveness aspect. We, uh, our terminology used more the collaborative. I don't know if it's, if it's a synonym or if there is at least an overlap, but it's really this collaborative aspect that not only the researchers that are involved in the newcomers project, but also the energy communities, which may not, it may not be subject matter experts at all. It might be just interested citizens who have gathered to, I don't know, either generate electricity or store electricity or trade electricity, for example but they have this interest in making this societal impact or environmental climate related impacts, for example, or just some so other, other kind of social impact, they would like to contribute their knowledge, their skills. So let's use some um, open source tools, um, uh, authoring tools or learning management systems or encyc free encyclopedia to allow them, to enable them to collaborate in making this science. So, this was the newcomers, this is the newcomers uh, perspective on how, wh what open education actually it is, you know, with the aim to support the open science slash citizen science perspective. And also like already mentioned with Dominic, I can only, you know, <laughs> make sure that this um, enabling the remixing, reusing, redistributing of learning content, uh, for example, by um, localizing the content or translating into the national languages of the project partners of energy communities. This is really important because if we get funded, you know, as consortium by the, by the European Union to provide some learning content, it's most probably in English. Sometimes it's translated into partners languages, but let's make it open format so that every energy community in the EU at least, but then also broader can make use of this content by translating it. I mean, if we are not funded for translating it, then let's enable the, the, the interested stakeholders to have the ability to, to translate it in an easy, easily adapted way. And also what I didn't mention in my presentation, we really use this uh, attractive multimedia format, which we will now, we already are partly offering it as in open format, but we will try to improve in the next six months to, to, to be really excellent in this aspect. So that really every energy community, wherever in Italy, France, UK, Belgium, I mean, wherever in Europe can make use of the learning content that we provide. So that's, that's what open education means for, for the newcomers consortium. And for me as a student of the master's program leadership in open education. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is very insightful of, of how uh, we can uh, be positioned about our own um, impact on open education. And I would like to, to hear about some other of, of, of this group. We are now 50 participants, <clears throat> excuse me, in the session. So maybe anyone else want to share about how open education take place in the, in the region, in their country, in their city. Great. I think we can continue with this discussion and the forum of the of this presentation. So we have. I, I don't know if Daniel wants to participate because I think he's trying to connect his audio to the session, but I'm not sure. Daniel, can you write something in the chat? I mean, Daniel Burgos. I don't know if he's trying to say something. Okay, maybe he's having issues with his connection. 
Well, I, I think if there are no further questions or comments. Could I, um, could I mention something just while we're... Please. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would just just very briefly because I would just like to comment on the the two cases we've we've heard because I find them very interesting. Um, they're very interesting for that reason that um, I've mentioned that their starting points were quite different. And I think in both cases, you know, one thing we always ask ourselves in the the master program is. I think we lost connection with Dominic. Yeah, I think so. So if I'll, I'll pick up if he, if he can, comes back, he can interrupt me. But I think that your question about um, how this fits with open education and, and, uh, and the general idea of, of OER and open education and the differences between them. One of the things that we find when doing the, this process of going through all these steps and identifying gaps and the designing policies is how local these decisions have to be. Well, first, of course, systemic. I mean, we have to think about not only OER, but the tools, the policies, the people, professional development, all these other things that come in. But also just looking at these two examples, and if, if you guys venture to take a look at these these policy briefs, you'll see how, how the solutions are radically different, the challenges are radically different. I think that's a, a very welcome perspective for, for open education, where we, we were talking yesterday about, about this in the dynamic coalition presentation, how we started out thinking that we could have, uh, in a way, one size fits all national big policies. And then when we look at it, it, it in, in practice, it seems like most of the stuff that we do ends up being very local, like examples we have just now in this webinar, you know, very specific targeted examples with different challenges. I think these tools and this process kind of helps see that. Um, I think it's a very powerful way to do it. Thank you. We have Dominic again, so maybe you want to. Oh, but I, I see that uh, you can see why uh, Tal and I do a good tandem because he basically said roughly what I was going to say, um, particularly emphasizing the, the systemic view. And I just wanted to say that uh, we really noticed that this kind of taking this view, like taking a step back and saying, yes, it's about open education, but it's also about having a good strategy or a good policy. And um, if you, there are very many reports that have been done over the years about OER is never going to reach its potential or open education is not going to reach its potential and it's often with uh, coupled with the argument because it's um, uh, often try people often try to implement it in their own kind of uh, comfortable group and as soon as it goes out of that it gets difficult and I think we have to deal with exactly this question what happens if we start taking it outside to to the mainstream to different contexts etc and this is what you always have to do if you're developing a, a strategy or a policy. So it was very interesting if I just take the second case of um, open education for a better world. Basically, this has been a hugely successful program. It basically, it started very small and then has suddenly, as Anna showed, exploded. And this is really great. So the next point is, let's just try and make sure it's sustainable and that everyone who's involved in this network has, a, has, um, has an experience which is valuable to them. And that's those points where you have to step, step back and say, well, okay, this is working well. Let's be a bit more strategic and systemic about it now to really make sure that we've also got open education for a better world in 10 years time and not just um, in, in the next six months. So that's kind of what we hope to be offering also through the program. And I think um, it's really interesting then to have the very specific cases bring, being brought by the students um, that we can look at together. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. And I think there are no more questions right now for real. So, well, uh, this was an outstanding experience. Uh, for me, I hope it is for, for all. Thank you for your participation. And please, let's keep in touch uh, through the, the forums and the media of the, of the conference. And, and, and let us know which of you are interested in collaborating with any other member of this uh, webinar. Uh, 
I think that that would be all for us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it will be it will be my, my, my pleasure to be here with you and learning a lot of, of you guys. So I think we can finish the session now if there are no more questions and, and thank you all for being here. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I want to take a peek of all of us and maybe you can open your 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 cameras for, for the picture just a, a few moments, please. Thanks a lot, Teresa, for sharing the session. Thank you, Eva, for being here for support. Okay, okay, okay.